All right. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, and welcome to this talk about data streaming for microservices with Debezium. I'm really happy to be here at this first Vox Microservices. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope you enjoyed the conference so far. And let me tell you a bit what you can expect in this talk. So I'm going to talk a bit about what is change data capturing, what can you do with this, so what use cases does it enable. I will tell you a bit how can we actually get hold of change data streams, and then I will show a bit of the stuff um, in a demo. So if the demo gods are with me, I've prepared a demo. I'm doing it here for the second time. I hope everything works as it should. And well, of course, I will tell you about this Debezium project, which implements change data capturing. Um, let me tell you a bit about myself. So I work as a software engineer at Red Hat. So please um, spare me with all the blue head jokes. I have heard them all by now. Um, <laughs> I'm the lead of the Debezium project, so that's the tool or the project I'm going to talk about today. Before that, I used to be a part or a member of the Hibernate team for a long time. One of the things I did there was I led the Bean Validation 2.0 spec. And I heard, by the way, there's a very good book by a guy living in Paris about Bean Validation 2.0. I highly recommend that one. Um, yeah, and sure, if you'd like to follow me, just check me out on Twitter. And without further ado, let's get started. So what is change data capturing about? And the idea is quite simple. You have your data in your database, be it customers, orders, products, you name it. It sits there in your database, and now you would like to be notified whenever any of the data item changes. A new customer gets created, an order gets updated, something gets deleted, you would like to be notified, and you would like to be able to handle those events and to react to those events. Um, and usually, you will stream those events into some sort of messaging broker, such as Apache Kafka. So that's the one we are using here. It is not bound by its um, definition to Kafka, but Kafka has some very nice traits, which I will discuss in a bit, which make it very, very useful for our purposes. So you stream those events into Kafka, and then, well, what could you do with them? Well, first of all, you could think about just data replication. So you could stream all the changes to another database. And now you might wonder why I'm not just using the replication tools which come with my database. And one reason could be, well, this allows you to stream data changes across vendor boundaries, right? So you could use some, let's say, proprietary, very expensively licensed database in production, and maybe you have this very nice open source database somewhere else, and you would like to keep it in sync with the production database. Well, CDC, change data capturing, could um, be used to do so. Or you could think about streaming changes from your production database to a data warehouse, um, or some you know, Hadoop cluster, whatever sort of analytics system. Um, well, of course, you would like to have the data there to be in sync with your primary data, and CDC will let you do that. Or think about this case where you have a marketing team, and maybe they would like to run some sorts of um, anal analysis where they would like to identify all the customers who have ordered some sort of product, a specific product, in the last two weeks, so they can send them out some sort of newsletter. Um, and maybe the marketing folks should not run those queries on the production database, they have their own database specifically set up for their team. And again, this database must be kept in sync with the primary database, and um, you figure it, CDC will help you. So that's all replication, but there's, of course, more to it. So um, it enables lots of interesting use cases for microservices, and I will cover them in a bit, so I'm just quickly going over here. So you could think about using change data capturing to keep multiple services, microservices, in sync. Um, we will see a bit about that later on. And you could also um, think about extracting microservices from existing code bases, right? Very often, you won't start on the green field. You have your existing monolithic applications. You would like to migrate to microservices to make things easier and nicely to manage. And of course, you must find ways to do these extractions. And as we will see in a bit, CDC could help you with that. So that's microservices, more on that later on. And there's a wide range of other use cases which gets enabled, let's say, by um, CC. So let's say auditing, right? You would like, or you maybe you're obligated to keep track of all the changes to your customers for some amount of time. Um, well, you have these um, audit trails already in um, with, with those events, right? And you might enrich them with some sort of metadata, like the, um, uh, the, the user which did a certain change. And then if you store this stuff um, in a meaningful way, well, you would have an audit log. You could think about... Um, Updating full text search indexes, right? Very often you would like to have some sort of full text search on your data um, using something like Elasticsearch. Of course, the full text search index must be kept in sync with the primary database, and change data capturing and the data streaming pipeline will allow you 
to do that. Um, same for caches or CQRS read models, right? So if you have this application architecture where you have one write model and then multiple read models which are tailored towards specific use cases, well, of course, those read models, they must be kept in sync with this write model, and CDC will let you do this. And then finally, one which I find very interesting and which I, I will show in the demo a bit is streaming queries. So let's say um, you are interested in the aggregate or in the number of new customers which arrived at your business in the last um, 24 hours. So, well, you could run this in some sort of polling or batch mode, but more interestingly, you could do this using streaming queries. So whenever a new customer arrives, um, this query will be um, run and give you right away this, um, this new update or this new result. And feeding data out of your database into something like Kafka, where you then can run a streaming query engine, that's a very, very nice use case, which we'll see in a bit. So I hope I could make the point that CDC enables quite of lots of interesting things. And now, of course, the question is, how can we actually um, get there? So how can we get um, those change data streams? And well, one way, or there are there, let's say there are multiple ways to, to think about it. And one could be, well, let's do what's usually referred to as dual write. So this means you have your data in your database, and then whenever you update it, you also update the data in the Elasticsearch index, or you also send a request to your cache to update or invalidate data in the cache. So that's dual write, but um, there are some issues there, right? Because what happens if, for instance, you cannot reach the Elasticsearch cluster? For some reason, you cannot access it. Then you have um, sort of a problem. Maybe you already have applied this change to your database. You have committed the transaction. Now you cannot um, access Elasticsearch. So what do you do? Do you buffer this request and try to reprocess it later on? Or maybe you implement some sort of batch job, which nightly will update the full text search index by just polling all the changes. Um, at least this adds complexity, and it means the index will be out of sync, right? So it will not be um, in sync with the current state of the data. But worse, there's some race condition here. This means usually those resources, let's say your database and Elasticsearch, they are not part of a one global transaction. So this means um, you don't have any guarantees about the order in which those changes are applied. So it could mean, let's say you have two requests which arrive quite at the same time, which refer to the same customer. It could happen you apply them a before B in your database, but then due to routing and so on, it could happen the requests are applied B before A in the Elasticsearch index. And that's, of course, very bad because then the data, um, well, it represents a different state than what's in the database. So that's not very desirable. And dual writes, just don't do it because it adds lots of problems, subtle problems for you. Then you could think about polling for change, right? So you could go to your database where you frequently ask for what has changed since the last time I've asked. Now the problem is, um, there's this dilemma, right? How often should I do this? Um, the more often I do it, of course, the chances are more um, increased that my data is more, more current. But then, of course, this will give you very high load on your database, right? So if you ask every second, um, this might be a problem. So you have this issue there between consist, um, or let's say being up to date and how much load do you create. But then also, well, um, how do you even identify change data, right? So this means you must have some sorts of columns in your model which, for instance, tell you when has a record been updated for the last time. So there's some impact on the model. And finally, well, how do you ide even identify deletes? So if you are polling and something has been deleted since you just um, last polled, well, there's no way you can find out about this record, right? So polling might be a approach in some cases, but usually, let's say, it's not, not ideal. So what else can we do? And the solution is, let's use what's already there in the database, and let's use this for our purposes. And this is, let's access the transaction logs. So by this, I mean all those, trans all those databases, they will usually work in the same way. This means there's a transaction log file, which essentially is append only. So if a change arrives, an insert arrives, an update arrives, the database will append this to this log file, and only then it will update the actual table files, right? And this is usually done by the databases for two purposes. One is transaction compensation. So let's say the um, database crashes while the transaction runs. Then when it comes up again, it can use the transaction log to either fully apply all the pending changes or maybe undo the transaction, but get the data to a consistent and uh, meaningful state. So that's transaction recovery. And the other one would be replication. So let's say you have a Postgres cluster and you have multiple slaves there, of course, those slaves must be kept in sync with the Marshall node. And the way it's done is essentially these log files are streamed or are sent, or let's say the changes are sent to those slaves. 
And if you think about it, we are essentially after something like being just another replication node. We would like to keep hold of all the changes. And by monitoring this, this log, we see all the changes and we see them in the correct order, right? Because the transaction log files, they will contain all the data changes right in the order they have been applied by a database. How the transactions have been serialized, that's how we will see this. And well, I said all those databases do it. Now, the problem is there's no standardized way to get hold of these log files. So there's different formats, different ways to do it. In MySQL, we have the bin log. In Postgres, there's the write ahead log. In MongoDB, there's the ob log, and so on. So there's no standardized way. But the good thing is that something like Debezium, it helps you with doing this. So we do all this hard work. We implement, let's say, those connectors to get hold of the information from the log files. And then we produce one rather generic abstract event which we emit into Kafka, which you then can consume. And for you, it does not make too much of a difference from, let's say, is this event from um, MySQL or Postgres. And now the nice thing of reading those log files is, well, you see all the events in their correct order. I already said that. But you also see deletes, right? So also deletes will be, an, um, will be appended as an event in the log file. So you see all the events, no ones will be missing, and it will be the correct order. And very nicely also is, um, this is fully transparent, right? So you don't have to alter your model. You don't have to add triggers. You don't have to add something to your application. This all happens essentially transparent to your upstream applications. Um, though they don't have to be altered. So that's, that's how we can do it, access the log files. Now, I said, usually we would like to use something like um, a messaging broker to propagate those events, and Kafka is a very good solution for this. And this is because, um, well, it has a couple of properties um, who just nicely fit for this use case. And by the way, who is using Kafka already? So, okay, I would say like one third perhaps, all right. Um, so, I, I won't give you the full primer for Kafka, but um, there are some things which I can mention. And the one is um, those um, topics in Kafka, they are persistent, and consumers can up and they can decide at which point they would like to consume a topic. So it's unlike JMS, um, where you don't have this control. This is all built into the broker. In Kafka, the consumer has this control. So he can say, or the consumer can say, I would like to read this topic from the beginning of all times. So if I have a topic with customer changes, I would like to read this from the beginning. Or I would like to read this just from now. Now, maybe I'm just interested in all changes you know, from now going onwards into the future. So that's very nice, this pull-based abstract approach, because, um, well, a consumer that way has means of being able to see the full history, provided it's the topic is configured that way, of course. Then, well, this all scales very well. So essentially, you can partition topics in Kafka, meaning you can add, uh, you can add huge, huge amounts of data. And the way it works is messages in Kafka have a key and a value. And this routing into partitions is done based on the key. And of course, what uh, we will do is uh, our keys um, of our messages, they are the primary keys of the changed records. And by th this, we achieve that whenever we see a change event for the same customer, this will go into the same partition of the customer changes topic. And then there we have the order guaranteed within this partition. So this means a consumer can come up and see all the changes applying to this customer, ABC, um, in their correct order, right? So there is no um, global order across partitions. So if your customer changes topic is partitioned, you would um, not be able to see the global order across all customer changes, but usually that's fine. Usually you just would like to see the consistent order for the events referring to the same customer or to the same um, product, whatever. So um, we have this uh, nice thing of scaling. And it's guaranteed ordering. So that's, of course, very vital. Remember, just do the right thing where we could apply changes to Elasticsearch in the wrong order. That's, of course, not desirable. And finally, there's this notion of compaction. So if, I mean, if we keep data for all times, well, those topics can become very large, right? But there's um, then this way to say, okay, I would like to compact this topic. And this means only the last message of each me um, message with a given key will remain behind. So let's say I have 10 change events for the same customer. Then I do this topic compaction. Well, I will only keep the last change event. But then this um, still allows consumers to see the current state of the customer, not the full history anymore, just the current state, but it gives you some sorts of trade-off between, okay, how much data do I store here and what, what sorts of use cases do I enable? Okay, um, then, okay, so now we know how to get hold of data changes. 
detail the transaction logs, we know, okay, let's use Kafka to apply those changes because, well, the um, properties of Kafka are just very nice for this. And now we could implement our Debezium connector for MySQL, let's say, based on um, plain Kafka APIs. But there's another thing which comes in very useful for our purposes, and this is Kafka Connect. And Kafka Connect is a framework which makes it a bit easier for us to implement these uh, kinds of, sor of source and sync connectors, right? So source connectors are connectors which get data into Kafka, and sync connectors are connectors which get data out of Kafka. And now Kafka Connect makes it a bit easier to implement this. Specifically, f um, it deals with offset management. This means, um, well, for instance, our connector is running for a while. Now it gets shut down because we would like to um, deploy a new version of it. Well, the, con the connector, of course, must continue to read the transaction log at, at the very point where it left off before it was shut down. And this is called the offset, so it must continue from the previous offset, and Kafka Connect helps us with managing those offsets. And what it also does is it provides a type system for us. So we can describe messages, um, their structure, and their, their the types of their properties. There's um, a schema registry, if you would like to use this, which allows us or which allows our consumers to make sense of those messages to see, okay, what are the data types, what are, what are mandatory fields, and so on. And there's a rich ecosystem of connectors around Kafka Connect. So Debezium apparently is, well, one set of connectors um, dealing with change data capture. But then there are lots of other connectors, especially very interesting sync connectors. So there's a sync connector for Elasticsearch. There's something for Hadoop. There's something for everything, really, uh, which allows you to set up such um, data stream pipelines really by just configuring those connectors without requiring you anything to code. So how would this look like if we deploy the thing? So let's say we are interested in changes from a MySQL and a Postgres database. So we would have set up our Kafka cluster. And um, by default, it would have one topic per table we are tracking, right? So we have a customer, an order, and a product table. So we would have those three topics. And then we would um, run Kafka Connect. So that's not only a framework, it's also I its own runtime, which is independent of Kafka, so it's a separate process. And then within Kafka Connect, we would deploy those connectors. So we would deploy the Debezium MySQL connector, we would deploy the Debezium Postgres connector. And then they would go to the database and capture the changes from the bin log in MySQL or capture the, change, um, the write ahead log changes from Postgres and emit them into the corresponding Kafka topics. And then on the sync side, we could deploy an instance of the Elasticsearch connector, let's say, to stream those changes into Elasticsearch. So that's how this could be. And now I have mentioned, or I have spoken quite a bit about um, those messages, but we haven't really discussed what's in there. So let's take a look. And I already, already mentioned messages have a key and a value. And the key is the primary key of the captured table. So if your primary key column is just a single column or sing, um, yeah, a single column, well, then this message key, it will just be a single property. If you have a composite key which contains multiple columns, then the key would be a complex structure containing all those columns. And then the payload is a bit more interesting, oh sorry, the value is a bit more interesting because what we have there is um, we have all the information about the data changes we are after. So there is essentially the before and the after state. And this means, well, if this is about a create, a create event, well, then there is no before state, right? The record didn't exist before. But if it, if it is about an update event, then we would have a before and the after state would be set. And if it's about a delete, well, then there would be no after state, just the before state. So we have before and after, and we have this source block, which contains some metadata about um, what's the name of this um, database, what was the timestamp position in the log file, um, what's the table and, and some more. Maybe we could also have here the query, which caused a specific change. So there's all this metadata there. And then in terms of serialization, we again have um, multiple options. So by default, or, or Kafka itself, it doesn't make any assumption about the data format. It's just binary data keys and values for Kafka. So it doesn't uh, matter. But what we have with Kafka Connect out of the box is support for JSON and uh, support for Avro. So with JSON, of course, we have those Re um, nicely readable messages, and we also can embed, if you would like, this, this schema information within each message, if you wanted to. 
And then with Avro, that's um, what I think most people would use in production. There we have um, well a binary represent representation, of course, and this is used together with the Confluence schema registry. So this means um, there's a registry which hosts versions of your schema, and consumers can come up and connect to the registry and get the schema so they know how to interpret those binary information. So, yeah, and... Um, Dbisium is a set of connectors for Kafka Connect. What we currently have is MySQL, Postgres, and MongoDB. Um, so those are very stable. They are very um, often used in production at um, multiple companies, really. Um, just recently, we started to work on connectors for Oracle and SQL Server. So they are, let's say, in a tech preview phase. And we may add more connectors down the road. So this is all based on community feedback, what people are interested in. Um, Cassandra comes up quite often, so we would maybe add those. But currently, we have the five ones at the top. Okay, so this is about um, change data capturing. Um, well, how does this look like? How can it be uh, uh, set up using Debezium? Now, I would like to talk a bit about patterns which apply to using CDC for microservices. And let's start with um, data synchronization, because this is such a common use case, right? So let's think about this case where you have maybe an order management system, and now you have two microservices, one which receives orders, then there's an item service which contains item information such as the name, um, size, and description of, of your products, and you have a stock service which deals with the inventory, how many items do you have in, in the warehouse. And now the order service it re receives a request um, to place some order, and very likely it will need information from the other two services, right? It will need to have information about item descriptions, it definitely will need information about the um, stock. So is this item even uh, still in the warehouse? Do we s can we still sell it? So the order service, it must have information from, this from these other two services. And now, of course, it could just go there and, let's say, implement some sort of REST call to access this data. But very easily, you get to something which you could call as a distributed monolith. So let's say, again, the other systems are not accessible. Maybe you have some sort of um, you know, uh, circuit breaker and stuff like that. But still, um, you have the problem. You cannot access this data. So what do you do? And well, one way could be to use change data capturing for this. And the way it would look then is, so you have those services. They all have their own individual database. And now we could set up Debezium and um, capture all the changes in the stock system and capture all the changes in the item system. And we would export those change events into Kafka. And all, um, the order system, it could subscribe to the changes in the stock topic also or the changes in the item topic and then it could set up its own local materialized view in its own database so it would create a rep representation which just is tailored towards its needs maybe it just contains a subset of the data but then it will be able to run and execute its tasks without calling out to those other other two systems what, of course, could happen is it could fall behind a little bit, right? So we might not see the very latest stock change. We might be a bit behind. But usually that's not a big problem. Of course, if you think about it, you need to be prepared to deal with these situations anyways. Because what always could happen, let's say in the warehouse, something um, falls over, right? So you lose um, 10 items. They are broken. You won't transactionally update your database um, because, well, reality isn't tra transactional, right? So you must be prepared for these kinds of things. And that's why I think having this sort of asynchronous approach is a very um, acceptable solution for this. Um, so this is, yeah, okay, we can think about exchanging data between different services, but we also can use CDC to extract microservices. So let's say those three components we have seen, they are actually really part of the one and the same um, application. And now you would like to extract the stock system, let's say, uh, the stock component into its own system. And one way you could do this is you could start and build up this new um, service on the side. You would still keep running it as part of the old monolithic application. And now you would like to test this new implementation which you have created. And you could use change data capturing to stream all the changes from the old system which still is in production towards this new system so it has the essentially the same set of data. Then it could run on the side, it could perform its calculations, it could, you know, t you could test whether it's doing the right thing, whether it's behaving exactly like you would like it to behave. And then once you're fine, well, then you would go and switch traffic to the new component and maybe you would go and alter the model of the of the application. Um, but as long as you are in this transitioning period, you could use CDC to keep the extracted microservice 
and the still running monoli monolithic application in sync. So that's one thing to do. The um, other thing is um, um, ag aggregate views. So this comes up very often, as I mentioned, by default, we see one topic per table which we are capturing. So um, let's say we have a customer and addresses, where we would have two topics, um, one for customer and one for addresses. But very often, what you would like to have is a, co a single topic which contains um, the entire aggregate, um, if you speak about this in terms of DDD, right, domain-driven design. So the addresses, they are dependent on the customer, so you are not interested in just pure address changes. You would like to see complex events which contain one customer and all the addresses. And there are multiple ways to do this, and you could, for instance, use um, something like K-Streams, so the Kafka streaming query engine. Um, what you could do there is you would join those topics, but it's very, very difficult to create those joins in a way they are aware of the transaction boundaries in the source database. So you might end up with cre creating aggregates um, which maybe are halfway complete because you just have seen or processed a couple of events which originate from the same transaction. So that's very tough to get right. Another approach which um, I'm currently favoring is to materialize those aggregate views right in the source database and um, to describe it how this could look like. So let's say we have this application which um, is using Hibernate to persist data. And now we have built something in Debezium just as a proof of concept, which actually hooks into Hibernate. It's a small extension. And then whenever a customer is persisted, it will automatically create a um, R r um, a view of this customer and all their addresses as a JSON document. It will insert this JSON with the customer and all the dependent data into a specific separate aggregate table. And then we would use Debezium just to capture changes to this aggregate table. And um, what we also have built as part of this proof of concept is a small um, routing component which then would um, take those aggregates and route them to the right topic. So let's say we have customer aggregates and order aggregates, then we would route them to specific topics like customer aggregate or customer complete and so on. And then we could use, uh, again, for instance, the Elasticsearch sync connector, which then would write this entire aggregate into Elasticsearch. And now the nice thing is this specific Elasticsearch connector, for instance, it can handle those complexly structured events, which are like a tree, and insert them into an Elasticsearch index, which is very nice because then you can search on this data within a single index. Right, so you would like to usually you would like to run those queries on a single index in Elasticsearch. So that's possible. We have this proof of concept. We also we are doing this lab tomorrow where we will um, cover this in a bit. So if you're interested, please feel feel free to come. The next thing which often is a need uh, in production is um, data quality, right? So you have set up this pipeline, you're streaming your changes from your production database to some other system. Um, but of course, you would um, be interested in, well, is actually the data in the secondary system, is it um, up to date? Is it correct or is something missing? Is something wrong? And um, so I was m talking to one user of the Bezium and they were telling me a bit how they are doing this, and essentially they are having two things in place. And the one is they um, compare in near real time record counts. So they very frequently run or compare the counts of customers or orders or whatever on source and sync. And uh, I mean, there will be some sort of small difference because, well, this is eventually consistent and asynchronous, but you could set up some monitoring, and if those differences in counts go beyond a given threshold, well, then you would raise some sort of alert and you would look into why I am lagging behind or what's going on here. So that's just comparing the numbers of records. So you have some sort of understanding, is my data complete on the sync side? But of course, you're also interested in, is the data actually correct? Or maybe there is some sort of you know um, conversion um, mistake going on. I would like to know that as well, of course. And what those guys are doing is, um, they have set up an approach where they, in the course of one week, essentially compare each record um, field by field. And the way they do it is, so they run this comparison algorithm regularly, and each time they just compare a small subset of the data. Let's say some sort of modulo operation on the primary key. So they compare a small subset of records in this run, and then in the next run, another subset of records. And then the course of one week, they have compared all their data. So they know um, if something is incorrect or not. So I find that very, very useful and a very um, a meaningful pattern to be applied so you're sure your data is correct. 
And finally, um, the last thing I wanted to mention in terms of patterns is um, leverage the powers of what's called single message transforms. And that's, it's, that's a bit specific to Kafka Connect, but it's very useful. And what this is, is um, it's small um, components you essentially plug into your connectors, um, which then can alter records or which can reroute records. And um, there are very, very many useful applications of these um, SMTs. One would be to just uh, do some routing. So you can, for instance, um, aggregate multiple tables into, the single, into a single topic. So let's say you have your data, um, your customer data sharded into multiple tables in your um, MySQL database, but you would like to see all of those five tables in a single customer topic in Kafka, then you could use such an SMT to do this routing. Or you could um, think about just conversions uh, of formats. So let's say you have dates or timestamps, that's a typical example. Maybe you would like to change those um, representations so specific um, consumers can make better sense out of it. Such an SMT would, be allow, would allow you to do this. So, um, the, the, yeah, that's some of the use cases you could do with, with those SMTs. And then, actually, it comes back a little bit to microservices. You also could use them to implement um, some sorts of compatibility layers. So let's say you have renamed a column in your database, and you would not like that all the consumers you have instantly must also you know, apply this change of, the renamed, uh, of this renaming. So you could add such an SMT to your connectors, which then re-adds the column also under the old name for some time. And then consumers, they could still read the value under the old name from the message, and then they would have some time to move to the new name, and then you would remove this SMT, and um, you would have smoothened out a bit this transition, uh, transition period. And there are a couple of SMTs which are provided with Kafka Connect, and a couple of them are provided with Debezium. So for instance, we have one which it just extracts the after state from change records. Um, so we have this complex structure of before, after, and source metadata. And many of the zinc connectors, they are actually just aware, or they expect some single flat record, which essentially is the after state of our records. So we have an SMT which does this ex extraction. So without or with that all being said, I wanted to show this a little bit in action, and I have prepared a demo, and what it is about is um, it's about some order management application. So we have two um, topics, or let's say two tables here, one table with orders and one table with order categories, and now I am interested in the aggregated order value per category. And for that, um, I I'm showing you how I would do that. So I have prepared this. It's all right here on OpenShift, which is um, the Kubernetes distribution of Red Hat. Let me make this a bit larger. And I already have set up a Kafka cluster. Um, so with three Kafka nodes, I have Zookeeper, which we need for, yeah, let's say, bookkeeping purposes for Kafka. I have uh, the, um, Kafka Connect, um, which already contains the Debezium connectors. And then what else do I have? I have a MySQL database, so that's the database where I would like to stream changes out of. I have an event source application, so that's just some fake order data generator which just inserts random data. And I have this aggregator application. And this aggregator application, it is doing this what I'm after. It's doing this um, calculation of um, aggregated order values. So let me start this um, event source. So I just increased the number of pods to one, so it's actually running. And now this should insert just orders into our order table. So let me go to the topics first. So there is, um, hold on. Um, so I'm using here this Kafka console consumer, which comes with um, Kafka, so it allows us to peek into a topic. And now I'm just interested in this um, categories topic here. So let's take a look at what's in there. It always takes a little bit, but there we see essentially just eight messages in this topic um, with um, these um, category descriptions. And it's essentially just a name and an ID. And there is no change going on here because I just set up those eight categories. But let's take a look at the orders topic. And there should be a little bit more traffic here because, well, this event source application, it's running, it's producing orders. So we should see some changes going on here. And indeed, we do. So this inserts orders and orders. Let me stop it again. And um, each of them, they have a timestamp, purchaser ID. And interestingly for us, it's um, the category ID. So let me take that. 
And now let's take a look at this um, aggregation implementation. And I have built this um, on top of Thorntail, which is a uh, runtime for microservices, Ken likes that, uh, based on the Java E and micro profile APIs. It gives you a fed jar, very nice to use. And um, that's my runtime for this microservice. And I'm using it essentially here to run this Kafka Streams pipeline. So Kafka Streams is an API which allows us to perform streaming queries on the, uh, on Kafka topics. And I can run you a bit through this. So essentially, I'm loading this categories topic into a K table. So this just gives me the current view of the topics, uh, sorry, of the categories. And then I'm setting up a K stream with the events from the orders tables. And this stream, it will produce new events whenever new orders are produced. And what I do then is I select the key of this stream to be the category ID, and I do this in order to join those two topics. And I only can join on the key, so that's why I'm using the category ID also as the ID of the stream. So I join um, those topics on the category ID, and then in this, pro in this um, object I produce, as a result of the join, I, say, um, I set the category name to the name of the category as it's retrieved from the joint category topic. Then I apply this grouping algorithm here. So I just say I would like to uh, group the stuff by key, and I would like to be this in time windows of five seconds. So K streams comes with windowed query support. And here I say I would like to have those groupings run in time windows of five seconds. And finally, I aggregate those values, all orders, within five seconds for one category. I just um, sum up their sales prices, and finally, I just convert it into a string, and that's it. And now I could sync these data um, into another topic, and actually, I'm doing this here, but more interestingly, I would like to stream those results to clients, and that's what I'm doing here by means of this peak operation. So this will be invoked whenever a new result in this aggregation pipeline arrives. And what I'm then doing is I am just sending a small JSON snippet with the category name and the aggregated sales value to all connected WebSockets clients. So I have also, as part of this um, application, I have set up a small WebSo WebSockets endpoint, and I send this category name and sales value to all the connected WebSockets clients. And I have prepared a small client. So let me open it, and it shows a dashboard, which now is updated in real time whenever new aggregated results arrive here. And now I have not shown you all the code, but it's not much more to it. And I think it's really quite, quite neat to see how much we can achieve using K-Streams, using Debezium, um, using Thorntail to get to such a nice data pipeline. <coughs> all right, so that's that. Let me get back to my slides. And now I just quickly mentioned I have set up Kafka on um, OpenShift or on Kubernetes. And um, I would like to tell you how I did this. And wh what I was using for that was the Strimzy project. And Strimzy is a project, um, another Red Hat project, where some colleagues of mine are working on. And this makes it very easy for us to deploy Kafka on Kubernetes or OpenShift. And what Strimzy essentially provides for us is container images. So I have um, nicely set up images for Kafka, Connect, Zookeeper, and so on. But more interestingly, I also have Kubernetes operators. And those oper operators, they make it very easy for me to deploy a Kafka cluster. So I just need to deploy some custom resource, essentially. And then this Kubernetes operator will take care of setting up a Kafka cluster which resembles or which matches this description. I can use it to set up topics, users, and so on. Um, there's a support version by Red Hat called AMQ Streams, but Streamsy is the community upstream project, so that's a really good, nice way to set up Kafka and OpenShift. Coming back to Debezium, so currently um, I mentioned we have support for MySQL, Postgres, and MongoDB. We are working on more. The current version is 0.8, so don't be fooled by this 0.x version number. It's very stable. Um, it's used in lots of production deployments. There's lots of things I couldn't mention. So for instance, there's this snapshotting, which um, allows you to get a consistent initial snapshot of your data, uh, which is very useful in the case you cannot get hold of transaction logs from older times. So you do the snapshot. Um, we essentially are pretty complete in covering all those types, which are supported by different databases. It's running on RDS. So many people would like to run stuff on Amazon RDS. So that's working as well. And um, the thing I'm very happy about or proud of really is, th is there's a very active community. So there's people from different companies using it um, who 
file bugs who contribute feature requests. So for instance, we just have two contributors who work on Oracle and SQL Server um, who expand those connectors. So that's really very nice for us to see. In terms of what what's coming next, um, yeah, we are working on Oracle SQL Server. And then going further than that, we have some ideas. Um, for instance, we, we, we are planning to look into reactive streams. So maybe you are not running within Kafka, but you would like to use the reactive streams API within your application to consume change data, change events in a reactive way. Um, this is something we are looking into. And then we have a roadmap on the website um, where we describe more, more of those things. And then I'm almost done, so to wrap it up, I hope it got a bit clear that change data capturing enables lots of interesting use cases for you, and Debezium, well, makes it very easy for you to set up CDC pipelines and um, use this. And very importantly, this all is, as I said, very transparent to upstream applications, right? So we don't have to change our applications, we just hook into the database, we capture changes from there, then it works very safe, consistently, and um, also reliably in case of ch failures, right? So if you think about this do right approach again, um, we avoid all these sorts of issues here. And with that, I'm done. Some resources, it's all on the website. And there is, um, yeah, four minutes left for your questions. <coughs> Any questions? <laughs> Everybody is shocked, flashed. Nothing to the IBM deal? <laughs> Uh-huh. Okay. D yeah, so does it run with Cloud SQL on the Google Compute Cloud? I don't know. I mean, if you are interested, please test it out and let us know. It, uh, it's interesting for us. The one thing is, so for Postgres, we use what's called logical decoding plugins, which must be installed on the server side. Not sure whether whether that's the case in, in this environment. Currently it's not, so then it would not work for Postgres. There is this means of native um, logical decoding, I think in Postgres 10 we are looking into implementing this, so then it might be able sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. More questions? Hmm. If not, I don't want to hold you for too long, just come to me after the talk and we can have a chat here. All right, thanks so much. <coughs>